Hello everybody, welcome to the first Wealth Talk of this year. As you know, Wealth Talks are a series of talks that we created at the end of 2020 in order to talk about uh, current events and things that might interest all our customers and friends, and also to try and uh, ask your questions to different experts. This talk will be held in Spanish, so if you want to follow it in English, you just had have to press the English button on your um, computers. Please push the English button on the screen and you will get the translated version. Um, empezar por un poquito. I will start by providing some context for what we are trying to do today. 2020 was the year of the pandemic, 2021 was the year of vaccines, 2022 was the year of the invasion of the Ukraine and of inflation, and 2023, well, we could say that it was the, the year of artificial intelligence. And many analysts, when they think about 2024, they tell us that it will probably be the year of geopolitics because there's different uh, wars happening in different parts of the world. And in addition, there's going to be a significant amount of elections and changes in many countries, such as the UK, the European Union, the United States, and all of that is going to probably make, the, make geopolitics the protagonist of the year. So to analyze all of these changes, we have uh, Charles Powell today. Charles is an expert in contemporary history, and he is a first-rate observer of today's world. He's been director of the Elcano Institute since 2021. He has a PhD in uh, history from the University of Oxford, and he has... Uh, taught in over 40 countries of the world, and it is a privilege to have you with us today. Charles, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure for me to be here. So, if you agree, we're going to start uh, with some of the topics that our customers might be interested in, and I will come straight to the point. So we were saying that probably 2024 will be the year of geopolitics, and that... Uh, a significant part of that will be influenced by the different conflicts, the different unresolved conflicts. The war in the Ukraine has been going on for two years. So please tell us what you think were the original causes for this conflict and what is the current situation, what, in your opinion, will be the consequences and whether you can see any way of resolving it in the medium or long term. Uh, well, it's a fascinating subject, but very difficult to summarize in a few minutes. But basically, as for the causes behind the conflict, I think that the most important thing, as we're seeing with many international conflicts that we're seeing today, well, the reasons are historical, political, and geopolitical reasons more than economical reasons. And Ukraine for several centuries basically has been the world's and that's not really related to Putin's invasion. I think that this basically stems from an atavistic drive in Russia. That is to say, Russia, uh, Russia's regime and Putin's regime, that's very difficult for them to accept the independence of 1991 in Kiev. And on the other hand, we're talking about a two-year-long war, but it's actually a 10-year-long war. It was in 2014 where Russia actually annexed Crimea and invaded the Donbass. So this is actually a 10-year-long war of revisionism on the part of our Russian regime that, well, is looking back to its imperial past. It's never been a nation state. It's always been an empire and it's been a nation state ever since 1991 and they can't really seem to accept this. As for the consequences, well, there are some that are very unpredictable as far as Putin is concerned. This afternoon, the Hungarian parliament has voted in the favor of allowing Sweden into NATO. So congratulations, Mr. Putin. NATO has two new members, Finland and Sweden. So the border that Russia has with NATO has increased by a thousand kilometers. Another inevitable consequence is, well, higher military spending military expenditure in 
in Europe grew by a significant percent. Last year, we spent 240 billion euros in defense, which is, well, quite the amount. And let's face it, the European Union is realizing that we have to take defense seriously. I think that that is the most relevant geopolitical consequence. And from the point of view of Russia, what, how can, what is the strategy? Well, we find ourselves at an impasse. The Ukrainian fear is that come May, Russians launch a counteroffensive, as Zelensky has said in many interviews, and he's made this point several times, and most advisors agree with him. The goal today is to survive. They want to survive. Ukraine wants to survive to be able to counterattack next year. Zelensky, last year or the year before, acknowledged that they've had 31,000 dead uh, as opposed to 50,000 Russians. But the fact of the matter is that Russia still has a huge potential. So when it comes to a long, drawn-out war, Russia has the upper hand. And as of today, both sides think they can win and there's no contact between Russians and Ukrainians. So, well, this terrible situation, this war remains as it is, which is costing 100 million a year. This wear and tear war is about 100 million a year beyond the human cost and the cost of the Ukrainian economy, which is brutal. More clear. So you don't think the situation is clear now? We don't think that they can negotiate. The military impasse remains. Russians are, well, they're having advances in, on the battlefield, but nothing significant. So if Ukraine manages to survive this in June, July, well, and maybe towards the end of summer, they'll start receiving their F-16s, their the Patriot missile launchers. And, well, this might really bring back balance towards Ukraine, but it's still a very difficult situation. Thank you. Now let's turn our attention to the other conflict that we have nowadays, which is uh, the conflict in the Gaza Strip. Uh, it was quite an unexpected, an unexpected uh, conflict, and it happened because of different historical reasons without uh, an apparent reason. So what is your perspective in terms of what may happen do you think the conflict may resolve uh and uh what do you think about the danger that the conflict might extend to other neighboring countries I think it's just what would appear that is being organized in the last couple of hours is a ceasefire that will be more or less long lasting that is to say avoid israel attacking rafa at the southern part of Gaza, which would be that would be terrible because as of now there's a million people in that city in Rafah, and these people would likely have to cross the border to Egypt and well walk in the desert of Sinai. Egypt said they would not tolerate that, so Egypt might make its way into the conflict. If we manage to avoid that, if Israel doesn't attack Rafah, this would bring an agreement to release the well the people Hamas took and this might avoid problems and well the issue here is Iran. Iran was the largest power under the Shah till after it fell and ever since then the Iranian people who have been kicked out of the international system because they want to get nuclear weapons they can still find their place so after this current situation we must incorporate iran as a regional power and i think that of course the two state solution is well this is something that basically everyone accepts except mr netanyahu's government who has a personal interest in remaining in power because if he doesn't turn and he doesn't remain there he'll end up in prison bueno, mismo lo and uh, what about contamination of the conflict in other parts of the region? Well, we're worried about the Red Sea now. As you know, 15% of the world uses the Red Sea because of the Suez Channel. And after these Houthi-backed attacks from Yemen to Western ships or, well, 
ships they believe might be negotiating or working with Israel. Israel, many, many shipping companies are using different routes. And we're talking about three to four weeks. And as for fleeting, well, th th these are huge costs. This could have a systemic effect on, internet, on the international economy, of course. By increasing inflation, this might delay the reduction of interest rates. And well, of course, at a sector level, this effect, this isn't affecting gas. Gas prices remain. Oil is increasing a little bit. And a few days ago, uh, a representative of Inditex said that they hadn't received no cotton throughout December because of this situation. So if this were to drag on, it could have serious economic consequences. But I can see that you are more optimistic in this case than in the case of the Ukraine. Yes, as far as Gaza is concerned, even though several thousands of people have died already, I think that this can enter a way of non-escalation. And as far as the Red Sea is concerned, these last couple of attacks, these British and American attacks, on Houthi rebels haven't been replied to by the Houthis. So I think that Iran, which is their back in power, has decided that they don't really want to escalate the situation. And it's a little... So I find myself a little bit more optimistic with Gaza than Ukraine. Bueno, vamos a dejar los conflictos. Thank you. Okay. Let's uh, leave uh, those conflicts for a minute. And let's focus on the different elections that are going to take place this year. Let's start by the United States. Everybody's talking that Trump might win the election. So the question is, do you really think that Trump may win uh, the election? My name is Estados Unidos. Well, I've been this last week in the U.S. interviewing politicians and, well, think tag representatives from the whole gamut of uh, U.S. thought. And, well, obviously, there's going to be Biden, Trump, Nikki Haley is going to remain until Super Tuesday, which is March 5th. She hasn't thrown the towel in, but today she, her, the Republican president handed in her resignation, which means that the Republican Party has been completely abducted by Trump and Trump is the candidate. Trump's campaign has one major worry, and it is, according to polls, 52% of Americans reject Trump as a candidate and 42% back him. That is to say, he's he has a huge level of rejection. Another Republican candidate would would have it in the bag. What's the problem with the Democratic with the Democrats? Well, we know Biden's physical and mental health and his age. He's 81 years old, and the well, people are scared that Latin and African American young African-American voters wouldn't vote for him, would abstain because they don't believe him to be an attractive candidate. There, something might happen. Why not change? Why not Trump change? Why not Biden change her VP, Kamala Harris? Well, she could she could hand her resignation in and in July, well, we July has the rebel Republican convention and August has the Democrat convention. I think he's still... A lot of I think Biden can still win it, even though a lot of people are wary about it. Basically, because even though the economic situation is good and we've got record employment, low inflation, most Americans aren't comfortable with the current situation. So, what do you think the government would be like? Um, well, Trump 2.0. There are two schools of thought here. Those who think that it's he's going to be much more radical, I I met up with Heritage Foundation representatives, which is a very conservative think tank. They're very close to Trump, and they say they have already identified 35,000 people who will join the new administration. They've interviewed them. That is to say they, they want to take over the whole federal system, 35,000 people. That is to say, last time it took Trump six months to realize he had one because he didn't expect to win. He didn't have the people. He didn't have the programs. So he doesn't want to waste any time. No, not at all. And they will probably be much more effective. What can we expect of them at an international level? Well, I think that there will be a 
a more acute rivalry with China. Uh, Trump has already said he would introduce a 10% tax on imports. So this also affects Europeans. And, well, surprisingly, one of the think tanks I met up with told me that they expected Trump to launch a military attack on Iran within the first weeks of assuming the role to ensure that Iran cannot develop their own atomic bomb, atomic weapons, because it's a little contradictory because up until now, Trump had said he said he was the only president under which there hadn't been any wars. This, is, this of course, would this obviously would be a conflict in the area, so I don't really believe it. But what does this mean for us? Well, it's not the end of NATO. I think that a lot of people have exaggerated the risk, but obviously a much more hawkish position. Future Trump advisors said that they would demand we spend 3.5% of our GDP on defense. As of now, our goal is 2%. What else could happen? Well, Trump hates the European Union. He loathes it. So the European Union as a global actor, well, we would have more problems. So it's all very interesting, all of these things that are going to happen across the pond. But uh, let's stay in the Americas. For us, Latin America is very important, and I'm sure that there's lots of customers from that region connected to this session. And a report has recently, publi has recently been published on the region. So my question is, in this new geopolitical context, what do you think the role of Latin America can be, particularly large countries like Mexico or Brazil, which of course play a very important role in supply chains. So, let me publicize my report. Our report is why Latin America matters. And what we do in this report is we question several topics. The first one is that Latin America is an economic disaster. And well, when we compare it with other emerging area regions, it's growing at a very reasonable pace. The second aspect, it's a political disaster. It's a coup-laden area and ext political extremism area. And well, when we compare it to other similar regions, it's actually a very stable continent where, well, democracy prevails. And the third aspect is that China has occupied Latin America and they have kicked out the European Union and the US and we have we proved that this isn't true. It is true that Chinese hold uh, commercial relationships with all Latin America countries. But when it comes to direct investment, the US and the European Union are much more important. This is something that's very important for us. The last topic in the last couple of years, we've had this, we've heard this idea that Spain made a mistake when investing in Latin America, and this saying this in Santander could be anathema. Our research proves that it is the best possible investment Spain has ever made. The return on this investment is high above what the U.S. or Europe have ever had. And as far as nearshoring, friendshoring, Mexico is in a finds itself in a privileged position given their geographic and political situations and they're already taking advantage of it we have a we've got a question there the coming pres mexican pre presidential elections which we will see this year and the paradox here is that amlo had a wonderful had a very good relationship with trump so looking to the future it might be interested that a conservative candidate who could win might have a harsher relationship with trump that is to say a center right candidate um would be more demanding when it comes to defending national sovereignty, whereas AMLO's successor could be much better, just like AMLO was good back in the day. And in any case, Mexico finds itself in a wonderful position. Brazil is a little bit worse off, as we know. Lula, given his position towards the Ukraine and Palestine and the Gaza war and... He's adopted an anti-Western position, a very clearly anti-Western position, very influenced by his old foreign affairs minister. And he's more pro-China. Their, their interest in participating very actively in BRICS, with, with BRICS, that is to say, Brazil is playing, a, they're playing a role 
they're representing the global south, which is something that Mexico isn't doing. So I think that Brazil finds itself at a worse position to take advantage of these trends of French or a near. I was in Brazil last week and I uh, was talking to some businessmen and they, well, they thought that Brazil could um, gain a little bit of the lost ground, but they were not. Uh, all of them, not all of them uh, agreed. Now let's turn our attention to Millet. A big mess, right? Well, the interesting part about Argentina is that there is a real agreement. The second in command of the International Monetary Fund went to Buenos Aires the other day and she was very happy. She felt optimistic. Basically, her analysis was that what Millet, ha the diagnostics Millet has run are correct. Uh, something completely different is that the omnibus law is the appropriate tool to run this adjustment policy that they have to implement. What the International Monetary Fund, as the World Bank said, most vulnerable sectors of society shouldn't burden the cost of this adjustment policy. But this is an adjustment policy that everyone believes is necessary. So it is very important. Even though Millet is disruptive and people don't really wrap their head around it, and a lot of people are feel a little bit off-put by him and are a little puzzled by him, the fact of the matter is that the Argentinian position was so terrible, it was that so only someone who is willing to disrupt and face these structural problems head on can really make the country see it through. <laughs> well, he is certainly very disruptive. Another question uh, about uh, Gu Guyana. Do you think that this will end somewhere? We're not scared about this escalating. Chat is and uh, sorry, Maduro. Yes, yes. Um, he's used this. He's used populism this scarecrow on territory over which he says Venezuela has rights is about half of the country of Guyana. This is a, an old British colony and, well, the UK has undertaken Navy maneuvers in the area. The US is backing Guyana as well. Oil is in the hands of Exxon, which is a very large American company, which will obviously be backed by the U.S. So we don't believe that the Venezuelan government doesn't really want to test its luck. They will use it as a rhetorical resource and a political resource, but they are never going to hit the ground on this. Thank you. How interesting. Let's come back to Europe. And But before that, let's focus in on Asia for a minute. I'd like to, I'd like to ask you two things. First of all, do you think there's going to be a new conflict between Taiwan and China? And then the role of China in the global economy and in supply chains. Um, what's your take on those two issues? As far as Taiwan is concerned, as you know, we had very recently presidential elections and the winner was a harsher candidate when it comes to China than Kuomintang. The, the Kuomintang is willing to meet in the middle. The ex-vice president is... He's a stauncher defensor of Taiwanese sovereignty. This introduces some risks, and that is to say that Taiwan could become more aggressive when it comes to defending their national sovereignty, and the Taiwanese are rearming themselves militarily, as are the Koreans and the Japanese. That is to say the whole of Southeastern Asia is increasing military expenditure to face the Chinese threat, and of course the U.S., is backing Taiwan. We don't see that there's going to be a military conflict in the near future. China obviously is going to keep on backing allegedly peaceful reunification between Taiwan and China. What could happen three, four years down the line, China could feel tempted to dr economically drown Taiwan and using cyber ta and using cyber warfare, of course, and and using illicit strategies to pressure Taiwan. But the Taiwanese people, what's interesting is that as of today, there's a very clear Taiwanese national identity, which maybe five years or 10 years ago wasn't that real. But now this is something that China has to face. So we, uh, we aren't scared of military conflict, but 
it is going to be a tense area. And when it comes to China, there are two schools of thought. There are those who think that China has peaked. China will be old before it's rich, given their demographic challenges. And China, as of today, has a lot of problems when it comes to their own internal market absorbing their production. So it's forced to export at a moment where this is becoming more and more difficult because de-risking, well, we're starting to see this. And that would be the pessimist outlook when it comes to China, of course. And then there are the optimists in China who think that we find ourselves at a new stage of Chinese economic growth and which, well, we're still t seeing a transition from rural China to urban China, because sometimes we think of China as a very modern country, but it actually isn't there. There are several areas in China which are way beyond. And I think that Elcano's position is that this internal transition, this modernization is still going to, well, take a large amount of their economic resources in the future. Okay, now we can come back to Europe. So there's going to be different elections uh, in Europe this year uh, and in the same way as you were talking about Trump 2.0 what do you think the ro role of Europe is going to be because people say that Europe is going to lose a little bit of its political clout yes. well I think we've seen that we, how we're becoming less wrong Europe is 10% of the world's GDP we are declining gracefully that's something Europeans are very good at and well the fact of the matter is I would say that we aren't really growing at necessary pace. We are over-regulating. We're very good at regulation. We are very proud of having regulated AI, but we aren't leading in AI. It's actually China and the US who are really bringing the technology to the table. So as far as competitiveness is concerned, we're lagging behind politically. What's the elephant in the room? European Parliament elections in June, we fear that traditional, conventional parties, which have usually dominated the European Parliament, basically popular party, the Socialist Party and Reformists, are going to lose seats. The left, uh, central left, is going to lose seats and the far right is going to grow or the more populist right. This could mean that these three center parties which have dominated parliament could have under 50% of seats after the next elections, which would mean that the more conservative part of the center bloc would tend towards a coalition with the populist right. And this will probably be reflected in two different areas. First, climate change it's probably going to be a European Parliament that is going to be much less militant and less assertive when it comes to fighting climate change. And secondly, it's going to be a Parliament that is going to be less likely to work on European integration and a defender of each country's sovereignty and their economic independence. This for companies can be good. And thirdly, it will likely be a European Parliament, much less activist as far as our international role is concerned. Yeah, but for example, for the single capital, single markets for capitals, it would be a step backward. Yes, yes, there will be less habitat for these sorts of reforms come June. And well, why? Because basically our public opinion tends to think that the European Union, which at the end of the day in this last stage, what we wanted to do was protect ourselves from some of the consequences which are less positive for global globalization aren't going to meet this goal. The clearest evidence uh, we have here in Madrid, the tractors today. The Yeah, I think it was today and, and tomorrow. Yeah. And in Brussels, my friends are telling me that the streets are full of... Uh, excrement and it's really uh, extremely um, unpleasant 
But, um, you know, the primary sector is demonstrating in very important countries, not only Spain, but also France, Italy, etc. So this is an example of how the European Union has, um, you know, to a certain extent, lost sight of the priorities of a significant part of their uh, population. And this is something that's happening in, in a country in Europe. How does this affect our agenda in the short term, all these mobilizations? Well, I think that, I think that this means that European politicians are less daring when it comes to backing transnational political stories. And I think we found ourselves in a point in time where European leadership is very weak. I think Macron is in, well, the last leg of his mandate. Uh, shouldn't, hasn't been a strong leader in Germany. Miss Maloney, well, she basically sympathizes with many of these positions. So overall, and what we're seeing here in Europe is a leadership deficit. Yeah, many people have uh, mentioned that. Let's turn to the United Kingdom. There's also an election very soon. Does it need yes, before January of next year. The Prime Minister had initially said that he would like to organize them in the second half of this year, and I think that, well, maybe May this year, basically because the Conservative Party is bleeding to death. They're losing all the by-elections they've held in the last couple of months. So I would say that May will see the elections, and there will be a government change, not because la Labour is something someone because people are tired labor doesn't really have people clamoring for them let's remember that labor has been in the opposition for 14 years so they're basically a credible government party as club is this uh, what would be the basic characteristics of such a government reform well it'd be a centrist government and there's this worry in the uk regional Lacks of equilibrium. Uh, the the north, of Scotland, the Wales are really lagging behind economically. Also in econo in education, infrastructure, and a Labour Party which has good results in Scotland, the north, and in Wales is going to really try to pr prove that they are the UK's party, not England's. Part government and Brexit. Uh, no, we can't really think of right. You didn't even. <laughs> so it will stay as it is. No one dares present a Brexit because a lot of Labour voters from these regions, which are less economically, uh, let's say, successful in the country, that's where the Labour Party finds their. Base. It's not in more dynamic, economically dynamic areas. And these people who believe themselves to be, well, globalization losers, you can't really tell them to go back. And I would like to think by thinking with the UK coming back to the European Union because I'm a Remainer. I'm, as they call us, Ramoners because I moan about Brexit. But I don't think we're going to be seeing this in, in the coming decade. No, muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much. I must thank you because, you know, we really stuck your neck out on many issues. Um, and that's really something everybody is thankful for. I have, a several, I have several questions from uh, the people connected uh, to the talk. One of the questions is whether, well, what the potential consequences would be of a withdrawal of the United States from NATO? Well, first, this is likely in my latest visit to Washington. This was the question I asked the most to all of my speakers. And I would like to say that even think tank representatives, the representatives of think tanks were most favorable to Trump, Cato, Hudson, uh, Heritage Foundation, even they said we're never going to pull out of NATO. What could happen would be a readjustment in our relative weight and how much we contribute. Americans are tired of funding, mostly funding NATO. They're not actually 
the Ukrainian war. It's actually Europe that's been funding, and this is something we must underscore, but they are somewhat sick and tired of us here in Europe haven't responded to the challenge of defending ourselves, and this isn't really fair. Poland is spending 4% of their GDP in defense. Spain is lagging behind, one3 but Poland is investing 4% of their GDP in defense. So, and of course, Baltic countries too. And if if they were really going to retire, well, NATO, we would have a European NATO, that is to say, plus Canada. And well, at the end of the day, this is, this would mean that Europe would have to invest more in defense and... On the other hand, I think that this crisis is a good thing. We've talked about strategic autonomy for a long time when it comes to defense. And yes, the U.S., well, we would have to take this more seriously. I couldn't agree more. There's a question about the conflict in the Ukraine, and they're saying that at the beginning... Everybody thought that the conflict would have a high impact on the prices of energy, but now prices seem to, seem, seem to have um, stabilized. But do you think that the risk still exists or, or, or not? Yeah, no, yeah, no we, don't, Matt. we aren't importing gas. And it's, we basically import, well, some oil, because these are long, medium to long-term contracts with the impact it, it's already gone. And, well, it, it's actually surprising. Germany, a country that would receive 40% of their power from Russia, has basically unplugged itself in two years' time. Like, this is record. Like, And we have to remember this because many times we say that Europeans are incapable of uh, undertaking a lead, less than popular measures uh, that affect us. And, well, the fact of the matter is that Germany has been a shining beacon. They've been less of a shining beacon when it comes to military spending. Be, but Germany is giving much more to Ukraine than France. France, which is a country that has, well, a relevant amount of military might. Well, they haven't really risen up to the occasion, but I think that the power situation shouldn't worry us. And there's not going to be a winter where oil and gas, that's already been taken out of account. And Spain, thanks to GNL, we've been getting from the US. And are European countries well coordinated in this respect? There's not really a single European power policy, and it is true that there was a little free-for-all when it started, and Germans, for example, invested very quickly in GNL facilities, even floating GNL facilities, in order to be able to face the consequences of cutting off Russian gas. And, well, we're not really... We're not that coordinated, but we've improved quite a bit. Spain has a challenge ahead, which is, well, we're a, a power island. There's another question about the role of China in the conflict. Well, China has a twisted position to Russia, and because Russia and China aren't systemic allies, and they're rivals in Central Asia, in fact. And China, what China didn't like about this war is that it's been a disruptive war. And Chinese, what they really prefer for their goals is a predictable situation without conflicts. But this doesn't mean that there's a, a Moscow-Beijing axis against the Western world. That's completely false. I've had conversations with Chinese state officials who which have been fascinating, and they have told us, and well, the problem is that we don't really know how to deal with Putin. No one knows how to deal with Putin. But don't see him as our friend. Putin is, is an autonomous actor uh, without control, and Chinese really can't have any influence on him. Uh, there's another question about the United States, and it says... If the American economy is working well with full employment, 
so what, what, what are people accusing uh, Biden of, apart from his age? That's a very good question, and there's research to prove it, which might be the which might be the Democrats saving grace, which is that people tend to remember only the f last year. And I th but I think that what they're criticizing is, well, first and foremost, he is to some American situations, the, the, uh, young people don't have an easy situation. So housing and education costs and health, well, that's still very relevant. But I would say that what Biden's missing is he doesn't have a country vision. He hasn't been able to share a country vision, and he's done many things. So, for example, the Inflation Reduction Act, IRA, which has benefited actually more, which has been more beneficial to Republican states. And this is something voters don't know. So Trump has made a huge effort to help them and this reindustrialization has been good but they haven't explained to these voters that it's the federal state which has made it so there's been a huge amount of yes no this is very interesting how interesting and there's a question from mexico um this person is asking if uh, trump is elected will nearshoring continue or will it become onshoring well, this is one of the most difficult things to predict. Uh, well, Trump Trump is America first. Biden is as well. This is something we've discovered in these last couple of years. There have been more continuity between Trump and Biden than what we expected to see. And I don't think there's going to be a radical change here because Mexico's already... The North American economy, that is to say Canada, US, and Mexico are so intertwined. I'll tweet it. It's basically impossible to break them apart the u.s isn't interested the economic cost would be huge and the human and social cost would be huge as well and trump well really he will talk about the wall again and the bad hombres drug dealers and he will be insulting and aggressive and as he is but I don't think that this is going to have an impact on real policies as far as this is concerned. And then the question is, could the consensus on an expansionist fiscal policy be broken? I'm, I'm talking specifically about uh, the ceiling on public debt. I think we're still going to see a uh, dysfunctional Congress, and yeah, there's no real formula there. No, there's no silver bullet. Yes, this will be as is, no matter what. Okay, so there's another question on the Gaza Strip, and the question is from Mexico too, is there a possibility that there can be massive migration from Lebanon? No. I went to Lebanon in June, July of this year and of this last year. And basically the problem is that Lebanon is a failed state, but it has been for a long time. It's a systemic failure. It's a perpetual systemic failure, what they have. And well, this isn't, that isn't the issue. The issue is Hezbollah still has the capability to attack Israel from from Lebanon, from their fields in Lebanon, and that could lead to an Israeli military reaction, which hasn't basically taken place because the Israeli defense forces can't fight two fronts. They don't have enough capabilities to do it. So I don't think that Lebanon, I think that Lebanon is no longer pro no. So you don't see a risk in this respect? No, the key aspect now is Palestine's civilian population. The fact that if Israel attacks Rafah, this would lead to a conflict with Egypt. Let's not forget that Egypt is the country with which Israel has the oldest peace agreements, which is their Camp David agreements. And if they were to break this, they're breaking the status quo for the whole situation. And we believe that no one wants that, not even Netanyahu's government. Right. Uh, there's a question here, which I'm sure it was difficult to answer. How can the world balance a reduction in population in developed countries and the scarcity in labor with a growing rejection of uh, migrants, but 
we haven't talked about this, but ma migration was a way of rebalancing things. And actually, migration was one of the key issues why we're seeing this increase of far-right parties. And, well, that is, well, actually one of the most difficult questions to answer in current European politics. Because if you take a look at the European map as, as it goes from east to west, our obsession with immigration has been growing in Spain and Portugal. It's not a particularly explosive subject as far as election subjects are, and it probably won't be during our European campaign, but it is in Italy and it is in France, and it is quite a bit in Greece given the arrival of regular migrants in, in Spain. Let's talk about the country where we find ourselves. Well, the fact of the matter is that we have a massive arrival of migrants, which media are only cover when they get here through dinghies and boats uh, in the Canary Islands, but they land through Adolfo Suarez. That's where they actually, that's how migrants actually, come, and we are allowing them to get here because Spain has a chronic deficit. We need workers and, well, societies have to find, uh, have to strike an internal balance. And I believe that Spain is a success case, but there are also worrisome parts. So, for example, Catalonia last year, most labor that appeared in, in local, it went to locals and all private work went to migrant workers. So we could have a dual market, dual labor market, but not people who have fixed contracts, but migrant and the private uh, market in least qualified situations and public workers who are, well, national workers. And this in these last two, three years, you see. But uh, this is because of the way in which positions are advertised, right? Yes, so there's no actual migratory policy in Spain, nor in Europe or Spain, Australia. As a country, we don't decide that we choose, we need more doctors or anything. We just need it. And, well, fortunately, this happens because if not, the Spanish economy would be even worse than it is. I have a couple of questions on technology. We normally talk a lot about technology at the bank. The first question is about the evolution of military conflicts with uh, the technological advancements well drones are our guest stars we're using drones massively both in the ukraine war and gaza this is something completely new and this really means that there's well conventional platforms such as tanks are less relevant and i would give ukrainians all our tanks tomorrow actually some countries are doing that denmark they're basically going to give them their tanks. Es por esta visión de que well, because they're not going to be used anymore. Se va a it's because it's a platform that's going to be used very little and in the very few areas where it can be used is on in the central, Euro central European plains, that is to say, Ukraine. But really, there are many other places where, we, where we're never going to use them ever again. And other... Uh, new aspects are, well, cyberspace. Cyberspace is something we know less about because there is very little information, but when it comes to cyber warfare, this is very important in this conflict. So these would be the newest elements, and as I said, more conventional weapons such as air forces, they played a very small role. The Well, the Navy... Well, it's been irrelevant. The Ukraine, Ukra the the Ukrainian army doesn't have a navy, but they have sunk Russian warships thanks to new technology. So there has been some technological innovation this war, and we will keep on seeing it. And and another question has to do with the role of cybercrime and cybersecurity, basically in the political context. Well, this is a structural aspect in our societies. In all general elections, we will see misinformation. Here at El Cano, we find ourselves in several European projects. Misinformation is, well, 
it's a reality of our political life. The use of certain algorithms, et cetera, et cetera. Ever in the last four or five years, we know that in all national elections and, of course, the European election and, of course, the North American election in November, well, this, uh, this misinformation will play a huge role, which is why I don't believe that we have to hold elections in Ukraine. Some international observers have demanded Zelensky to organize elections in Ukraine now, and given the current situation, the only possible beneficiary is Putin. Absolutely. Because there could be huge manipulation. Yes, definitely. There's another question from Argentina, which is, what, what your opinion is about the way in which Argentina can use its uh, energy resources in the future? It's a topic, but it's true because some topics are based on reality. Some cliches are based on reality. And as I said, the IMF second in command went to Argentina and she said that Argentina has huge economic potential. And when we say that Latin America matters, we say it because basically our two largest transitions the digital and the energy transition the, the the transitions we're trying to implement in europe we won't be able to undertake them if we don't if we don't take advantage of these comparative situations so lithium and chili but also water and other material goods which argentina has and the tragedy with Argentina is that even if it's a very wealthy country in many aspects, well, other aspects haven't backed their growth, even though up until the 60s it was a very wealthy country, it, relatively speaking. So, uh, as part, so this could happen as part of the current transformation? I think so, but if we have to reorganize the Argentinian economy's fundamentals, but if we manage to do this, I don't see why Argentina can't ben can benefit of these systemic changes. There's a question about payment systems in financial markets in Europe and the, alternative, the Chinese alternative to SWIFT. Do you think it could be a threat? Not as a threat, no, not really. And I mean, our key researcher for these things has been followed this very closely, and we've published some things in El Cano, but we don't see these as threats. And do you think we, we, there may be a greater unity between uh, or amongst the different payment systems? Not in the short term. There's another question here. Which, are, which is asking how you think that demographic changes with aging populations in many countries, particularly in Europe, how is this going to affect the geopolitical context, if at all? Well, they do have an impact on our expenditure, and one of the reasons why we are more worried about, the, about security, it's because our aging populations are asking for more expenses when, when it comes to certain public goods, so mainly health. We didn't expect to devote 3% of GDP to defense at this point. We expected to have a peace dividend, and we had it for some time, but that's already gone. But the good of this is that as all societies advance, they also age. And as I said, it, maybe China will become old because they're rich. And well, definitely India, of course, right now, the country is the most populated country, 1.4 billion people. They're not thinking of these dilemmas, but maybe 40, 50 years down the line, they will start handling these situations. So it has a, a huge impact on defense, and we can't really raise armies. Even Israel, which has a younger population than we have, one of the problems they have is that they can't really keep their reserves 
hop. They can keep it for a couple months, but not for years. And in Europe, if it weren't because of migrants, the Spanish Navy and the Spanish Army, yeah, I don't know, of course, yes. And that's good. It's a social ladder if you do it in an inclusive way and it can contribute to social cohesion. The UK has the exact same problem. The UK is thinking of reducing their criteria for everyone in order to have more lax positions when it comes to nationality because there aren't enough UK volunteers. That and do you think the idea of a, of a European army is possible? Not in the short term until we don't have a European federal state. And I, I doubt I'll see that in, in my lifetime, nor will you. And I think that we will see a higher defense expense. And the, UK, the European Union had wanted to defend 35% overall. As of now, we're spending about 15%. So 15% of our military expenditure is being done jointly. And if, if that is done that way is a, a, at a military industry level, it won't be that good when it comes to joint armies. So what we'll do is, as we do in NATO, we will use the troops in a more coordinated fashion, but they will still be national armies. The last question, because we're running out of time, the last question is about India. We haven't talked about India. So there's also going to be an election in India. So what do you think the role of India is going to be? To me, India is the most interesting country in the world, yes. Because it's um, it's a pivot between China and Russia. It's the largest democracy in the world. It's still growing at a, an incredible pace. And they still have a young population, which is very well trained. Technologically speaking, they're very... They're very well trained. They have a diaspora in the U.S. and Australia and Europe, especially the U.K. So they have human capital. And as I said, they participate in BRICS. And G20, we can see a more and more assertive India, more and more sure of itself. And they're, and well, they're, offsetting the Western world and China and Russia. They will never be completely aligned with ourselves, but they will never align themselves completely with China and Russia because they share a great deal of our values. So I think that the most interesting aspect is the growth of this global South. And if we had to completely name this, it would be India. So, that was an interesting topic which uh, we had left out. But thank you very much, Charles. It's been very interesting and I want to thank you very much because uh, I was uh, pleasantly surprised by uh, how assertive you were in uh, answering uh, the questions of our audience. So thank you very much for this. It's been a pleasure to have you. And I hope this is the first of many conversations. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Gracias también al, al... And thank you to the audience. We have uh, some customers physically present with us. And thank you, everybody, for connecting. You know that this and all previous um, talks are available on our private banking website. And, uh, you know, you can always uh, listen to what Charles said and see whether he was right or wrong. Thank you very much.